Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to Difficult Research. This is my channel. Thank you for being here and supporting us. Here's KJ reading the train story. This is Chad. Chad likes to tell stories. Chad is a leader. Chad loves laughing. Chad posted his train stream on AVAL forum. Woo woo, all aboard. Hello everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, part of this difficult research, this difficult journey. Tonight we are going to be reading March 22nd of 2018, As I See It by Chad Daybell. The train dreams rolling into the future. When I was a teenager, I worked for two summers as a landscaper at the GRA Park in po Provo. The park was owned by my father's employer, Geneva Steele, and I would help sweep out the pavilions and mow the lawn. The main features of the GRA Park was a large train engine and coal car that had been moved there and placed near the playground. Guardrails had been added along the train's outside walkways, and any dangerous items had been removed or welded shut. Park visitors weren't allowed to roam anywhere on that train, and on Saturdays there was often 50 kids swarming all over it. I hadn't thought of that train in years until the night after President Thomas S. Monson's death. I was given a curious dream that night where I saw Joseph Smith standing on the roof of a very similar train, and he was preaching to a small group who was sitting on benches in the coal car. The train was slowly creeping down the track, and Joseph was speaking loud enough that all the people could easily hear his words. He gave a witty remark, and the whole group laughed. Then I saw subsequent prophets standing on top of the train, preaching to the group. The coal car seemed to magically lengthen as additional people joined the group, but everyone could still clearly hear the messages. When Lorenzo Snow appeared on the train engine roof, I noticed a second and third car had been added. I also saw the church's apostles listen to President Snow and then relay his message to the people in the final two cars. That is where the dream stopped for the first night. As I pondered it, I was told by the Spirit that the train represented the church up to 1901 when President Snow passed away. Through the first seven decades of the church, the prophet and apostles were regularly meeting with the saints of the church. These men were steadily receiving revelations and they would openly share what they saw regarding the future of the church. Some of the best descriptions of Latter-day events come from those early prophets. Spiritual experiences and interaction was uh, with, with decreased ancestors, deceased ancestors were common among the members, and these accounts would be published in the Desert News or church magazines. For example, the futuristic vision by Patriarch Charles D. Evans that is still often quoted first appeared in a uh, 1893 issue of the church's contributor magazine. rolling into the 20th century. Two nights later, the dream resumed with Pres uh, President Joseph F. Smith atop the roof of the train. He still addressed a small group in, in the closest coal car, but he was also speaking into a microphone so that the saints in the adjoining cars could hear his message. I was told this scene represented general conference moving into the age of radio. I saw a similar scene involved George Albert Smith looking into a television camera while on top of the train. 
which I later discovered matched the fact he was the prophet at the time of the first televised general conference in 1949. The LDS church membership didn't reach one million members until after World War II. The saints were still a fairly isolated, peculiar people. Spiritual experiences were still occurring regularly among the saints and being published by the church in magazines and sold in book copulations. I was shown the covers of some older books that I still own, such as Spirit World Manifestations and Temple Manifestations that are filled with wonderful accounts told by common LDS members. Mm -hmm. I then saw a montage of conference talks by prophets and apostles giving details of spirit world experiences, such as David O. McKay's vision of a celestial city. I also saw fiery patriotic sermons by Ezra Taft Benson and prophetic addresses by apostles such as Bruce R. McConkie and many others. Physical preparation was a main topic and I saw the saints in the train cars responding favorably to these messages. Then I was given an outside view of the church train. It had transformed into a sleek silver train moving at a pretty good speed. The first car behind the engine had a second level deck where there were several prime seats to view the countryside. I glimpsed President Gordon B. Hinckley in the front seats accompanied by his counselors. Enter the upper deck. Suddenly I felt myself zoom through the wall of the train's upper deck. I found myself sitting in that upper deck toward the back. I really felt out of place sitting among famous authors such as Gerald Lund, Dean Hughes, and Chris Heimerdinger, but they welcomed me warmly. I saw uh, my first series of novels known as the Emma Trilogy resting beside me and I was told the segment of the dream represented the late 1990s when the LDS book market was really booming. I was a new author, but I was treated very well by Desert Books, Seagull Book, and all of the independent LDS bookstores. I participated in many book signings across the Western states, and I got to know the store managers who loved it when I stopped by the store and autographed the copies of my books they had on hand. There was a strong camaraderie among the authors and we enjoyed seeing each other at the LDS Booksellers Convention and other events. I remember thinking at the time that an abundance of gospel knowledge seemed to be emerging from a variety of sources. Roger K. Young's books about upcoming future events were selling briskly and last day's topics were openly discussed online and, and at preparedness fairs. I'd started my publishing company, Spring Creek uh, Books, and we were finding success in sharing similar messages. I was also writing my Standing in Holy Places series based on what I had been shown during my near-death experiences and readers responded favorably. The second dream ended there in the upper deck. President Hinckley turned to face us with his cane held high and a big smile on his face changing of the guard. The third train dream opened in the same upper deck as before, but the number of uh, authors seated near me had thinned out, and those of us who remained seemed nervous and uncertain. I sensed that the warm relationship between the church, 
owned bookstores, and the authors had somehow grown cold. I saw President Thomas S. Monson sitting at the front with uh, his counselors. We could hear them talking intently about lowering the age for missionaries, and later they were focused on the effect uh, of the uh, effect of the missionary surge. Then President Monson went quiet. He never turned around or acknowledged us. I realize now that that was part of the President Monson's prophetic mission because a man on the train I didn't recognize leaned over to me and said, times have changed. Gospel knowledge won't be served on a silver platter anymore. We are now in an era where the saints must seek out truth and develop their own testimonies rather than live on borrowed light. I asked him why we couldn't just keep the status quo. And the man said, there must be a space of time when the saints show their true allegiance before the coming tribulations. The prophetic word had been pulled back for a time as other witnesses come forth to testify of these truths. The saints must learn to recognize the spirit in their lives rather than following the prophet like unquestioning, uh, unquestioning sheep. I thought the man was being a little harsh, but I was then shown the true, true condition of the saints. I was shown many fancy homes with shelves filled with the books that were published in the 1990s. But these books had been uh, unopened for many years. They ranged from the, the work and the glory uh, series to President Hinckley's book, Standing for Something. They had become status symbols of alleged righteousness rather than being read for the powerful information contained inside of them. Following historic patterns. I was shown that this was a repeat of previous times in a history when the saints have become a little too comfortable and complacent about the gospel. Three instances in particular came to mind of when the prophets pulled back a, a little and another and other witnesses came forward. I first saw the prophet Lehi standing in Jerusalem trying to convince his fellow citizens that the city was in danger. Lehi uh, wasn't the appointed prophet at the time. Jeremiah was, but as the first chapter in the Book of Mormon explains, he had been given a vision of coming events, and he felt called of God to be a messenger. The people he preached to weren't receptive to his teachings, and the Lord eventually commanded Lehi to leave the city with his family. And in that same year, there came a many prophets prophesying unto the people that they must repent or the great city Jerusalem must be destroyed. Wherefore, it came to pass that my father, Lehi, as he went forth, prayed unto the Lord, yea, even with all his heart, in behalf of his people. First Nephi chapter one, four and five. The second instance I saw was Abinadi, who test, uh, testified against King Noah and his priests. King Noah's people had reached a point where even the Ten Commandments were unfamiliar to them and the king rejected his message. They ended up killing Abadonati by burning him to death had changed the pride of their hearts. Mosiah chapter 11, 4 and 5. That there was a man among them whose name was Abinadi, and he went forth among them and, be, and began to prophesy. 
VS 20. Finally, I was shown Samuel, the Lamanite, who traveled to the land of Zarahemia to share the message of the Savior's birth and death. He also testified against the Nephites' wickedness, and they took exception to that. They shot arrows at him, and only through miraculous means was he saved. Lehi, Abinadi, and Samuel, the Lamanite, didn't come from the mainstream religious religious structure that the church members were used to, so their authority was questioned. Their words were also more direct than the people were used to hearing. But these messengers always pointed back to the Lord's chosen leaders as the ones to follow. Their messages pricked the hearts of many good people who changed their ways and more steadfastly followed the prophet. We believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy, by prophecy, and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinance thereof. Articles of Faith, number five. And we believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. Article of Faith, number six. By prophecy and by the laying of the hands by those who are in authority. Modern day similarities. I was then shown that the Lord is using messengers and witnesses in our current day. I returned to the upper deck and saw a man known as Spencer sitting nearby who had written a book called Visions of Glory. He looked like he'd been put through the ringer. We were soon joined by a pair of new authors named Julie Rowe and Hector Sosa that I had published books for. Much like those earlier messengers, these three authors spoke of troubled times coming, including upcoming earthquakes in Utah, but they always pointed back to the living prophets as the ones to follow. I watched as each of these authors sent their messages to the saints in, in the other train cars. There were many who believed, but many more who dismissed them waiting for the prophet to spoon feed them the gospel as had occurred in the previous decades. Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he received them, walking in all holiness before me, for his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yes, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of, of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. For uh, thus saith the Lord God, him have I inspired to move the cause to Zion in mighty power for good and the diligence I know and his prayers I have heard. Yea, his weeping for Zion I have seen and I will cause that he shall mourn for her no longer. For his days of rejoicing are come unto the remission of his sins and the manifestations of my blessings upon his works. For behold, I will bless all those who labor in my vineyard with a mighty blessing, and they shall believe of his words, which are given him through me by the Comforter, which manifesteth that Jesus was crucified by sinful men for the sins of the world, yea, for the remission of sins unto the contrite heart. 
DNC chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. In the commotion and confusion of our modern world, trusting and believing in the words of the first presidency and quorum of the twelve is what is vital to our spiritual growth and endurance. I glanced at President Monson and his counselors, but they didn't acknowledge the commotion happening behind them. I realized it was because they knew the saints needed to seek their own light before the tribulations. I was told it wasn't a coincidence, coincidence that our beloved prophet was mostly silenced by the age during the years these books were most prominent. Then the dream closed. Number one do not necessarily reflect church doctrine or they may distort church doctrine. Paul warned the saints in his own day of the spiritual dangers they faced. To the Galatians he wrote, I raise my warning voice as Paul did that there are those that trouble you, people that pervert the gospel of Christ. I would be shirking my duty if I did not raise my voice to warn you of the challenges we face today. I remind you of Jesus' prophecy regarding the last days which we now live. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall, be de shall deceive the very elect. We are saddened when we witness some of the very elect deceived as Jesus warned. One thing that is constantly on my mind is knowing that individuals who don't stay focused on the simple doctrine and gospel of Christ will eventually listen to false teachers and self-declared prophets and adopt worldly philosophies. Another concern I have to you to, uh, is, is you live so close to the church headquarters that some of you have become casual in listening to the Lord's servants. Some choose to miss sessions of stake and general conference because they see those special weekends as a time off from their church assignments. It is hard for me to understand why anyone turns to other voices on the internet without first turning to the voices of the scriptures or the voices of the living prophets and apostles. Number two, while there are many examples of looking beyond the mark, a significant one in our day is extremism. Gospel extremism is when one elevates any gospel principle above other equally important principles and takes a position that is beyond or contrary to the teachings of the church leaders. Expensive preparation for end of day scenarios. We must be careful where our footsteps in the, uh, life take us. We must be watchful and heed the counsel of Jesus to his disciples as he answered these questions. Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man, and I add woman, deceive you. Today I repeat earlier counsel from church leaders. Brothers and sisters, keep the doctrine of Christ pure and never be deceived by those who tamper with the doctrine. The gospel of the Father and the Son was restored through Joseph Smith, the prophet for the last dispensation. Do not listen to those who have not been ordained and are set apart to their church calling and are not acknowledged by the common consent of the members of the church. Be aware of organizations groups or individuals 
claiming to have secret answers to doctrinal questions that they say today's apostles and prophets do not have or understand. Do not listen to those who entice you with get-rich schemes. Our members have lost far too much money, so be careful. In some places, too many of our people are looking beyond the mark and seeking secret knowledge and expensive and questionable practices to provide healing and support. An official church statement issued, issued one year ago states, uh, members should not use medical or health practices that are ethically or legally questionable. Local leaders should advise members who have health problems to consult with competent professional practitioners who are licensed in the countries where they practice. Brothers and sisters, be wise and aware that such practices may emotionally be appealing, but many ultimately prove to be spiritually and physically harmful. Promises in exchange for money, miraculous healing, that claims to have special methods for accessing healing power outside of properly ordained priesthood holders. The fourth dream, President Nelson. The final train dream began with President Russell M. Nelson and his counselors sitting at the front of the upper deck. The new first presidency quickly made several changes within the church that shook up many members of the church who were, and it stops. And guess what, folks? If you'd like to read the rest of Chad Daybell's post or uh, any, he, uh, his May, uh, any of his May articles, we invite you to go to the private GRI forum and be sure to pull out your pocketbooks because he's just damn trying to take your damn money. And I'm going to close by saying this because it's very important. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Drop the mic. <laughs> Very good.